So now we'll get into some of the nitty gritty that we deal with on a, on a regular basis. Like I said, we, we review well over 300 um, statements of work. Not all of them come to fruition in a year. And there's a variety of statements of work. There's statements of work for sponsored research um, that can go in the form of a TSA or a CRADA or an SPP. And developing that statement of work and doing that statement of work homework up front will help us define the correct contractual mechanism to use. If you say, I'm going to write something and, and predetermine what that contract is going to look like before you've even gotten a statement of work, you're doing yourself and your sponsor a disservice. So it's really important that that statement of work, what you really want to do with that sponsor and what you want to deliver, is what drives the contractual mechanism so that we get it right from the very beginning. There are some different nuances, obviously, from writing an F, a statement of work that's an FWP that's going to be direct funded, and whether it's a SPP or a CRADA, um, and, or whether you're submitting to a pre-proposal as a subcontract to a larger FOA grant and BAA. So some of the tips and tricks I'm going to give you are a little bit generic, but we want to try and touch on, on what some of those unique differences are between, between those and, and how to navigate around so that you're not recreating a different statement of work for each time you're going through it. So some of these we'll go through very quickly because we've kind of already touched on it. You need to be responsive to your sponsor's needs. So, you know, gone are the days where, you know, I have this cool science, I'm sure I'm going to write this statement of work and everybody's going to want to do exactly what I want them to do. So we're really not looking for to sell what we do we're looking to the sponsor to say what are, what are the needs out there and how can we meet those needs. So if it is federally funded, again, make sure that it's consistent. Your subcontract statement of work is consistent with the awarded work. So you may have participated, for example, with Northwestern as a response to a BAA or a FOA. So you need to make sure that your piece of the statement of work that's just the sponsored research that you're committing to do with Northwestern is consistent with their overall project so that you don't have any problems um, down the road. And certainly uh, communicate with your sponsors about the intent to publish, especially when working with um, universities and things of that nature. So those good discussions, just like Ushma talked about up front, really set the stage for making sure that you have a good solid statement of work. Markings. So this can be a, uh, quite a challenge. Statement of works are not proprietary. We can't hold them close just with Argonne because we are an FFRDC. All of our statements of work go through Department of Energy as well. So you can't promise to a sponsor, oh yeah, we'll hold it close to us because we absolutely have to share it with DOE. So they, they shouldn't be marked as confidential. We don't, we don't want their trade secrets. If you need their trade secrets, in order to do the science that you do, you can keep that at a technical level from PI to PI. We don't need those secrets at an at a institutional level. So keep those kinds of things out of that statement of work and things will go much smoother and you'll have way less headaches, guaranteed. So try and keep anything that's really sensitive or proprietary to that sponsor outside of that statement of work. So PI to PI, you can protect that data a little bit better. But once it's, you know, we share it with DOE, we may share it with University of Chicago as our MNO, um, you know, you've got different levels of security there that you can't necessarily assure that particular sponsor. But you can assure that sponsor that we do protect their information. So, you know, we're not, we're not like the standard other non-private um, industry person out there that may want to use that information as leverage in another area. So we don't share our proprietary information or our sponsor's information with competitors that may, we may be working with. So for example, in ES, they do a lot of transportation science. You know, they're working with GM, they're working with Nissan, they're working with lots of different um, car manufacturers. If they didn't have a level of trust that we're not going to share what we learned uh, from this company with that other company, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't have the transportation center that we have today. So it's very important that they have that trust with us. Schedule is huge. For all types of um, 
proposals, the, the schedule's really big. So your budget has to match the schedule and it has to be reasonable. So you need to look at all of those things. You have to provide for contingencies. I used ES as an example prior. Are they supplying an engine? Or is there a long lead time for particular procurement? Make sure you're building those things into your schedule so you're not constantly having to go back to the sponsor saying, I need more time or I need to stretch this out or having to amend the statement of work or proposal in order to get an adequate timeline. So build in those contingencies and avoid hard dates. Obviously, we can't always control the timing of all the review process. Can't always control when you're waiting for a sponsor to deliver some results back. Maybe you've got an iterative type of statement of work where you do some work, you provide it to them, they give you some feedback and say, okay, go at it again. If you're waiting on them, you need to make sure that you're clear as to how long is it gonna take for them to get that back to you so you can get into that next phase of your project. You could have a multi-year project. We actually prefer the longer you can actually clearly define your, your task milestones and deliverables. If you can write a three-year statement of work with all potential phases, we would rather approve that once even if it doesn't go, you know, even that it doesn't go all the way to phase three, then having to deal with approving it, that statement of work phase one, and then you write an amendment for phase two. If you can define that throughout the life of that project, then do that up front. But make sure you're putting in number of months from this event, number of months from this event, that's partly where those milestones come in handy and those go, no go decisions. Because once this takes place, okay, once we've received that, then it'll be this number of months, as opposed to putting in hard dates. Again, it becomes a contract, and that sponsor could hold you to that date and say, hey, you didn't do it by this date. And um, so avoid litigation. As much as I love our legal team, let's avoid the litigation. Budget, make sure that when you're um, some of the challenges that we see with the multiple statements of work that we get is when a statement of work changes and the budget doesn't necessarily reflect those changes, that's a challenge. So definitely work in concert with your division financial representatives for throughout any change. Um, it's very, very important that the budget matches that statement of work. They're going to be, we read through it to make sure that if you've, talked about going to a conference as part of this statement of work, that that's also covered in the budget as an example. If you're talking about purchasing some equipment, some maybe bigger than just a consumable, we're gonna be looking to that budget to make sure that that's in there. If you're using the APS. So all of your proposal package has to be consistent with your statement of work. So be mindful that as your statement of work is iterative and it changes, that you're updating the rest of your package to reflect that. Make sure that you document any preconditions, assumptions that potentially could be outside the control of the laboratory. Again, if it's um, material being uh, delivered or that sort of thing, um, if there's any um, regulations or other certifications that have to come into play or licenses, you need to make sure that those are in line and uh, make sure that they're documented as to, to what has to happen in order for, to make that go through. And um, don't, one of the things that we've seen, in fact, I've seen it recently, where we're going to do this work, and then in the future, we're going to do all this other stuff. Well, keep that, all that other stuff future out of that statement of work. That statement of work should only be from the beginning of what you're going to do to the end of what you're committing to for that budget and for that statement of work. Um, you know, be very careful not to blend programmatic work that you're doing. Um, this is kind of goes to that double dipping issue. There may be things that, you know, obviously we have a tremendous infrastructure here. That's why we always say not only why Argon, but why not private industry? Because we can't compete with private industry. So we may have very unique capabilities and unique facilities that it really bars private industry from being able to do that work. 
but you can't, you can't really necessarily blend the two within that statement of work. So don't put in there what DOE is doing on the side as, and make it kind of look like it's in-kind contributions to that particular statement of work. So you have to be really careful to keep your statements of work very independent. And again, we already talked about the confidential confidentiality of the data from other sponsors that may potentially be a competitor. Again, that's building that trust and that unique relationship with that sponsor so that they know you're not going to share what you're doing for them with any other sponsors that you may have. So um, that's building that trust and that strong relationship. So if the statement of work happens to be for a CRADA, you need to make sure that it's very clear who is doing what. Again, it's avoid that whole we thing because we means nothing. I mean, it's, it's very unhelpful and we have to completely, we'll, we'll kick, reality is we'll kick your statement of work back and say, who's do, who is we? Is it we Argon or is it we your sponsor? So make sure that it's very clear, in, especially for a CRADA statement of work, what is the participant doing and what are they bringing to the table in that statement of work and what is Argon going to be responsible for? Another quick tip for CRADAs is to make sure that you're identifying any background IP. Um, in, you'll, you'll put that typically within your questionnaire. But again, it also ties back to the budget. So whatever it is that Argon is doing should be exactly what that budget is for and then um, what the participant is bringing to the table. So those things have to be done in concert and be appropriate and match and as well as any government funds that are coming in. We always get, we do a lot of foreign work here at Argon. I would, you know, I think we do the most foreign SPP work throughout all the national laboratories. They are a challenge, but it's a good challenge to have because it's great work and great science that we're doing for some of these entities. So, um, but remember the lead time for approvals is a little bit longer. And those statement of works really should explain what the benefit is to DOE and the U.S. government. So, so why is this partnership important? So everything goes back to kind of what I originally said at the beginning in the opening, that does it fit within the mission of DOE and Argonne's mission? So it's wonderful to be able to do this great science, but how, how does it fit and how does the U.S. benefit? So any work under that statement of work has to be consistent with the long-term goals and objectives of, of the Department of Energy. So that's why it's important when you start working on your statement of work to get your program managers kind of pre-approval and at least their cognizance. It could be an area that they would love to be able to fund, you know, your direct program manager, but they can't. But having that concurrence and that support to yes, this, that, that's good evidence to say yes, I'm in the mission of DOE and so my DOE program manager even if they can't kick in any money, and sometimes they can, to help support that program, they can provide that level of support, which is important to get that through. So again, quickly, changes. If they, even if it's a zero dollar change, if there's a significant change in the statement of work, it's called scope creep, and we need to make sure that we know what that is. If you're not sure if it's a significant change to the statement of work, run it past us and, and you know, we'll run it up the chain to see does, is that really a material change or is it not? So we need to understand what's really changing in your statement of work and if it's material. And then we'll guide you as to whether it needs a formal amendment or, or what needs to take place in order to do that. Um, try not to be too vague. Oh, we're gonna provide technical support. Well, you know, we, we can't, if that's the only thing in there, and I've seen close to $2 billion uh, proposals that are less than a paragraph, and it's like, really? How can, how can you put what you're gonna do in a paragraph, you know, that was really three sentences and one was a bit of a run on, so it was kind of long, but you know, you really can't put enough meat in there for all those reviewers to really know what you're doing. So try not to be too terribly vague don't get so technical that I can't understand it. My background is actually as in finance and accounting. So I've 
you know, I've learned through the years. I've been in the national complex for over a quarter century. So I'm just savvy enough technically to be dangerous, but don't assume I'm gonna understand what it is you're writing. Don't be overly ambitious. We talked about that already. You're not gonna solve global warming in the next six months. If you can, please do. But likely, that's a little over ambitious. So you must have a unique capability. Again, not only think, why should Argonne be doing this and why are we interested in doing this, but why can't private industry do it? So what are the barriers there and, and why isn't that available in the private sector? Um, don't make promise, don't put terms and conditions within that statement of work. We have a contract piece that outlines, you know, what those terms and conditions are in terms of ownership of IP, disposition of, of um, all, you know, all of those kinds of things. It has the financial contractual arrangements. Um, you know, it has all of that stuff in there. Don't put it in the statement of work. Don't promise that we're going to have it at a certain static rate because, as you know, our rates change. Um, so don't, don't try and mix the two. Really, the statement of work needs to be pure and simple. What is it that you're going to do? Task milestones and deliverables. And if you keep it to that, uh, you'll, you'll be better off. So just a few resources. Again, we're here to help. And so if you have difficult statements of work, maybe new sponsors that you've never engaged with, you want to get TCP involved early so that we can help you navigate that new customer relationship or that new sponsor relationship. If the statements of work are kind of new and novel, maybe you're headed off in a different direction and you don't know if, if it's within the DOE mission or not, you're pretty sure it is. So let's have those discussions up front um, to make sure that you know, we're, we're headed in the right direction. You're not leading a, a good sponsor down a path and then having to say, oh no, sorry, we can't do that work. We can't engage in that. If you're concerned about scope creep throughout the life of your project, certainly you can come to us. Um, new research, if there's any change orders throughout the, the time frame, um, or any other basic questions that you have. Um, my philosophy is that the only dumb question is the one that you should have asked and didn't. So, you know, you're, you're going to be treated well by anybody in TCP to help you get to what you need. We may not be the right person, but either your sponsored research analyst or your business development executive will know who to bring into the table so that we can get you done um, and keep you rolling. We've got these, this will be available again, like I said, um, at the end, and we'll post it out on our website, make sure that everybody's available. We will be sending out a survey as well so that you can provide any responses, but hopefully there was, you know, even for the most, um, prolific PIs who've been around a while, being well grounded in these basics will help you get through. Sometimes we get into so many complex ones, we forget some of those, you know, just baseline metrics that we need to be successful. So hopefully everybody has at least a little something they can take away that, that ups your game a little bit. So with that, I'm going to open it up again for any questions, concerns, comments, be, be happy to answer. If you can, again, hang on for a mic so that we can, everybody can benefit from your question or comment. Um, just to double check, um, official use only is considered one of those um, s markings that we shouldn't be utilizing, correct? We'd rather not have OUO because Different, there's different definitions of how, what people define as official use only. So that's kind of the lowest lying one to a certain extent, but you're never sure what that sponsor thinks you're gonna be able to share that with. So it's best to have that conversation with the sponsor saying, Can, we're gonna treat everything as business sensitive, regardless of whether it's marked or not. It really doesn't need that OUO marking because we're, you know, we're not going to publish their statement of work or any of the data that they give us publicly without their knowledge. So, 
you know, I would prefer to have that not on there and, and just make sure that you have those conversations to assure them that we're going to treat it as business sensitive regardless. Okay, and my other question is, once we've worked with you guys to develop a really good statement of work and we have all of the documents and it's been through our division for approval and that kind of stuff, what's the timeline for how long it typically takes to get from when we submit the Pearl package to when it's signed off on completely? What's a typical timeline? What should we expect and plan for? Oh, so that's, that's always a good question, and it's always a, it's dep it depends. So federal is different from private, privately held. So our current timeline to get it through those, that long list of institutional reviews is five days or less. That's the average from the time we receive it from the division, that, that Pearl package, to the time that we're getting it to DOE for approval. That's where the it depends kind of kicks in. If it's federal and there's no foreign nationals on it and they don't have to send it anything to headquarters, then we're getting those approvals in two to three days or less. If it's foreign, there's a whole litany of other things that have to happen. And the current time for foreign approvals, I'm telling people to add a minimum of two to three months onto that. So 12 weeks is not uncommon right now if it requires foreign. We have to get IP approval in advance. Pete can probably speak to that as well. But I think 12 weeks is right now, unfortunately, our standard. 12 weeks starts once everything is finalized. So invariably, when you're working with someone who can fund research and development at Argonne, they're a bigger institution, they've got some infrastructure, uh, they have different departments, whether it's accounting contracts, they probably have an in-house legal, maybe they have an outhouse legal, and they'll need to go through their review. So I would categorize that whole group of folks that see it on the sponsor side as the decision-making unit. And it's not until that entire decision-making unit has signed off on everything, the work, the budget, the payment terms, the IP terms, that the foreign review starts. So, uh, so I guess there's nothing we can do about the foreign review and approval. We've tried, uh, but there, there just isn't. And uh, the reality is the, the more you can make an advocate of your technical rep on the other side to go through and to shepherd the scope of work through their gauntlet, uh, to, that will help. That'll help set the expectations. It'll help give context as to who we are. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I'll get a red line agreement back saying, why would we agree to these terms? And then we say, well, hold on. We're a national lab. Let's tell you a little bit about our history, who we are. You know, we're not your competitor. We're just a basic research institution. And that really does assuage a lot of concerns, not all of them. But it's important to have those conversations up front, set expectations. That helps reduce the cycle time. And then we ship it off to DOE HQ and they do whatever they do. The more and more we find that if you have, even at a very informal technical level, um, you know, a scientist level, these conversations about what DOE is and what the national labs are, as you start the networking process early on the conversation, the less work that their legal and our legal have to do downstream when time is really off the essence. Uh, the other thing is, if you'd rather not have these conversations, open someone from TCP. We are more than happy to give them the two-minute overview of what Argon is, how we work with companies, what sort of companies we work with, and give them kind of a context in which to think of themselves. Because there, I don't think there's actually a major industry with which we haven't worked in the past or don't work now. So that's a confidence-setting metric for your potential partner. Use us at any stage in the process. The earlier, the better. And for private industry, I would also recommend just if you set the stage and the expectation that we have, we have ways to streamline that process. DOE has, sev has approved several standard pro formas, you know, contract terms in advance. So as long as they don't make changes to that, then we're good. So understanding the laboratory up front and why we're in FFRDC and how to do that helps streamline that contract process. I like to tell people the first time you get the contract, we're not private industry. We're not, we're not competing 
in the same way that a private industry contract would if you're subcontracting between two entities. So I tell people, you know, I'll, I'll send you a draft of what that pro forma is, but you have to promise to keep your red pen in the drawer and your hands sitting on your hands. Because if you want to get this go through, because we have some projects that are very time sensitive because the, the unique um, work that has to be done might be in a very short window of time. It could be that it's some environmental concerns and that window of time, by the way, that sweet spot has to be done in these two months or we're gonna have to wait a whole year, right? So understanding that and telling them up front, in order to be able to do that for you in that time frame, you have to put the red pen in the drawer and sit on your hands and know that we're actually bringing pretty decent terms and conditions to the table because we're not profit motivated. So those things that they're used to having to negotiate with a red pen don't exist. So, but they're so used to anybody that they're contracting with, the very first contract is not necessarily their best deal. Our best deal is that standard pro forma with no changes. That's the best deal that we can offer in order to streamline. Another question. Uh, yeah, Lee, uh, first, uh, can you make the presentations available you know, on the website or through email? Because I found some of these slides are very helpful for us to Absolutely. keep. Absolutely. Absolutely. This presentation is being recorded. It will be available. The slide deck will also be recorded. I will defer to my technical folks over at SEPA. Again, I'm not the technical guy. He'll be able to tell you where the, where the slides will be posted. So, yeah, I have a question. That is, uh, I know we're not competing against uh, companies for our SPP project, but we do uh, compete against uh, other national labs. So, you know, I imagine you've, you've done some comparisons and our process is versus other labs' processes. My impression is some other labs processes are somewhat uh, simple or straightforward. So uh, my suggestion is uh, for your office to learn an uh, exchange with some other labs, especially the labs in West Coast, uh, so we can uh, have uh, our compatible processes to compete with other labs. The laboratories all have what's called the Tech Transfer Working Group. It's a working group that meets at least twice a year to exchange uh, best practices. And so we are always learning from each other. And you know, I think that that's a very good point. Uh, but you know, the one caveat that I, I will say, you know, we have learned from some of our, our friends uh, at the other laboratories, and we've seen some of the metrics. And when you compare us with, say, an Oak Ridge, our cycle time is in fact faster. One of the reasons why in aggregate our cycle time is longer, we do more foreign work as, as Diane indicated. So whenever we're dealing with a foreign sponsor, whether that's foreign owned or controlled or influenced, that could be Toyota Motors USA, it could be a US company with a 51% you know, controlling in, uh, interest, that adds on right off the bat another three months, two or three months. Uh, and that's, that's tough, but your point is well made. Um, there is some also differences between the labs. You know, I do like the, 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 the very poignant observation that we don't compete with industry, but oh yeah, we'll compete with other national labs to some degree. We all have our unique core capabilities though, and that's one of the reasons why DOE makes its checklist every few years. Who's the uh, computational science, uh, which are the computation science labs, which are the bio labs, which are the nuclear labs? And that's a good exercise because we really do want to focus on our, our core capabilities. But just recognize that every lab has a different culture. I mean, Argonne, we work with many different, uh, as Diane said, many different auto companies, you know, sometimes even competitors. And we do so in a collaborative fashion where we can, but we also understand the, the sanctity of the data that we're given. There are other labs that don't deal with proprietary data uh, without permission from the lab director. And that's very different than how we operate here. So it's important to understand that there are differences even between the capabilities, but your point is a good one. We, do, we are always trying to learn and we are always trying to make things better. So thank you for that comment. 
if I may just address the point of the, the slides and the recording will be shared via a follow-up email. Um, they will also be shared through Argon today and Snapshot. And then the slides will uh, uh, remain permanently on the TCP section of the Inside Argon website. So um, there's multiple places you'll be able to find that. So. One last question about our most difficult part, that's advice payment. Uh, the, um, to many sponsors, this is always a difficult issue. So are we pursue something different than the 50% advice payment? As in some cases, it's a major bottleneck issue. Something that the entire le so the the question is largely around the advanced payment criteria and it's it's an important one, especially where we're dealing with small businesses and this is one that I can tell you, this is one I can tell you that the entire lab complex struggles with. One of the criteria of SPPs or creatives is that there is some sort of advanced payment, and you have to understand the broad brush. Why is that? Well, what happens if the lab gets stiffed? Ultimately, the lab is a nonprofit. The lab draws down from the Department of Energy. And ultimately, if a sponsor doesn't pay, the United States taxpayers have to foot the bill. And that's not, that's not appropriate, and that's not what we want. Now, how does, how does that get addressed? There are a couple of different mechanisms out there. Uh, there are, um, you know, I think that one of the, there are three new programs that the DOE has put out, um, small business vouchers, uh, TCF awards, and that allows, a substantial amount of government funding, if not a voucher, for some sort of cost share. Some of the programs have in-kind contributions, but there are programs out there that can supplement and help alleviate the need for the advanced payment. As for the advanced payment itself, um, you know, the details matter. Uh, if there's equipment that needs to be purchased, that's something we need to address. Uh, but typically what we look for is a three-month advance. And so that, that doesn't necessarily have to be 50%. When you go down to the low dollar, it typically is. But we have some flexibility as to how we can work with folks. Uh, but it is, it is a concern that is valid. There are programs that are trying to fill the gap somewhat, but we haven't found that solution just yet. But, but it's a good point and something that uh, everyone should be aware of. Other questions? very much. We well, appreciate your attendance and see you soon.